Oh, my name's Ashley Nicole. I'm the host of Passion, Purpose, and Paychecks. I'm a trial lawyer, and I also do the show. I also do some motivational speaking. And I'm just excited to talk to this wonderful panel of amazing, radiant, powerful women. I heard my brother yesterday say, I don't call them strong. I call them powerful because that means something different. That was swagged out. I was like, all right. All right, little bro. What's his name? Good for you. So I want to start off like this because everyone... Has, we've heard so many phenomenal speakers, and I just want to make sure everyone remembers exactly why you all are so dynamic and on this stage. What is, give us your name and one business statistic that you're the most proud of from your company, just so we can know who we have up here. And I'll start with you. That's a great question. Um, I have so many businesses. <laughs> um, one business statistic. Um... I would say uh, we, Fame Integrated Marketing Communications, we are global. We went to South Africa and brought our, our not only our business, but our clients' business and entered a new market last that year. Amazing. So that was amazing. Let's give it up for that. Hi, everyone. I'm Kashira. Again, I talked to you earlier about monetizing your brand. Um, I think I'm just sharing the compliment because word statistic is throwing me off. But um, when I launched my cosmetics line last year, within four months of business, we were featured in Essence, and I was really excited about that. So Very exciting. Candice. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Candice Armour. You guys know me. Um, the business to statistic that you guys are a part of is that my first ever conference was completely sold out. So, Yay. yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lucy Tyler. And the business statistic that I will share is from uh, my direct sales business, having become a seven-figure earner this year, which means I was able to help a lot of people in order to get to that uh, space. Everybody, who's, I just said it, but I'm Arian Simone, and I honestly didn't know when you said statistic, I said that means I have something that has to quantify, and then Candace took mine, so I said, <laughs> let me think. Um, so you guys heard my journey earlier about PR and marketing, I would say, you know, in the area of films, and I will definitely say one of the, the statistics that I was proud of, and I honestly can't remember the number, but we've had so many number one films um, that from a standpoint of box office gross things, we're de definitely our firm was in the hundred millions. Amazing. And I guess my statistic I, is not a quantitative one, it's more of a qualitative one. I think the biggest thing I'm proud of is that when I walk into my workplace or my warehouse and there's always someone new there and they're just like, I really like working here. And they're like, can I get your number because I want a job here. So I'm always just kind of like, wow, that we've created a space that actually people enjoy coming to work awesome. and can be their often excel. That is wonderful. So Candace, I'm going to direct the first question at you um, since I know a little bit about your journey. Everyone here has said how difficult entrepreneurship can be. And we've heard a lot about the hours that are put in and the scenes that we don't see on IG. But what is the one thing you wish you'd known prior to quitting your nine to five and jumping into entrepreneurship feet first? I wish there was one thing I wish I knew. I mean, it's such a learning experience and it's kind of like, it's definitely a faith walk. So when people say jump, it's actually like an action that you have to take and you're never gonna have, it's never gonna really feel like the right moment to leave. You just kind of have to trust God. But for me, one of the biggest things was just like knowing that my faith was gonna be tried so much in that season and knowing that everything wasn't gonna be perfect, but I had to just trust that everything would work itself out. And I know we keep talking about God, but at the end of the day, that's what kept me grounded throughout this process. Over the past six months, I have been without a job planning a uh, several thousand dollar conference. Like that doesn't happen every day. It's literally the grace of God and me being grounded and praying, waking up, praying over every one of you guys. I touch every single chair that you guys are sitting in, praying yes. over it before um, you guys step foot into the room. So all of it, it, it takes work, but it, it's so, so, so worth it. Kashira, what is the best investment you've made to date in your business? 
Kashira. Kashira. <laughs> it's okay. Keep helping me out. I got you. <laughs> um, to be honest, the best investment I made was actually enrolling in a group coaching program. And it's not mm -hmm. because I'm trying to plug coaching. But to be honest, for years, I struggled with the mindset of investing in myself. I was the person that would only buy a book. $20 class here and there. I didn't I didn't understand this concept of investing in myself hundreds and hundreds sometimes thousands of dollars. Right? Like that never outside of going to college, I didn't understand right. that. But I finally took the leap and enrolled in a program that was beyond my price point at first and I made it work. But I told myself because you're putting in this figure, you have to show up. You have to be committed, you have to do the work, and you have to make sure you get this back. And so I was on every call on time, I watched every video, I did the assignments whether I was scared or not and made the investment back in, in a week just because of that faith, right? And obviously at the end, you know, continue to accumulate more, but it really showed me that you have to shift your mindset around how you view investing in yourself and change your perception and realize that if you're serious about your dream, then you have to have, you have to see it as a value and that it has value. So why not put money into it? I have someone tell me, you know, I'm gonna wait till I get my first client to enroll in your program on how to get clients, why? <laughs> right? You know, you, you have to sometimes take that leap. And Candace and I were talking about this on Thursday before the VIP event, that poverty mindset of being afraid to move things around, not realizing if you take this money, and I know it's probably the last, but if you plan it, it's supposed to grow, right? It's supposed to grow into other things. And so you have to see return on investment. You, if you multiply 10 by zero, it's still zero. Right? So you have to put in something to get something out. Just like I talked about the VIP event with the stock market. You can't tell Apple, I'm going to hold this and see if it grows and then I'll pay you later. Like, no, you have to put in money and there's a chance you're going to lose it. There's a chance it's going to multiply. So investing in myself by hiring someone that's been there, done that, that's where I wanted to be then beyond where I could even imagine being and having them help and give me the blueprint drastically shifted my business. And Chris, I want to talk a little bit about risks because there are risks, right? What's the, the biggest risk that you've taken in your business journey? And how did you muster up the courage to take it? I mean, every day is a risk. <laughs> you wake up and it's a risk. So I just, I, 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 I move forward. <laughs> that, that, that's really what it's about. But if you don't mind, I would like to jump back on your question because um, I think that a lot of times when we talk about investment, we talk about you know the financial investment. But I really think another side of the investment is your time. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times when I work with other entrepreneurs or uh, you know other women or people in business, um, they're really caught up in making money that they miss opportunities because they didn't want to invest their time into um, you know, building relationships. Yeah. And so a lot of, especially early on, and even sometimes still today, um, I built relationships by investing my time in offering pro bono work. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the things that you're seeing today with MADE and, and Chicago French Press and all these different things I'm doing based on earlier on relationships in, in business is a lot based on relationships mm -hmm. and if people like you and if people, you know, enjoy working with you and if they feel like, you know, she she did that for me. I owe her. You know, I I I, I want to do something to propel and elevate her as well. So I I, I really I, I agree with you with, you know, investing financially, but also just your time can go a long way as well. And people will remember that. But based on back back to you with your the risk taking, every day is a risk. Um, you know, I think the biggest risk that I've taken, I probably can't think of that one, but it's the consequence of moving forward because if you move forward to do something, you know that it's going to cost you. It's going to cost your time, it's going to cost your money, and you're going to have to figure out how is that how you're going to create that for yourself to, to constantly and keep that going. So um, every day I feel like I'm doing that. So, yeah. That's a good point. And I want to come to you. Jen, right? Or do you go by full name Jennifer? Okay, let me know with these names now. <laughs> she talked about, Chris just talked about building relationships. How are you able to now, not with your friends that you've had, but how are you able to sort through which individuals that you meet currently you want to invest in and those that you are not so led to invest in? How are you able to make that distinction at this point in your career, now that you're already settled? Huh, it's interesting. I, 
one of the things, well, on, on the spiritual side, I'm always looking for discernment and mm-hmm. just really just first asking God, is this the person that, you know, I should be pouring into? And then I look for if there's a similar path or similar vision, um, because I, if they're going in a space where I've been, then I know that I can truly offer some value to them. And so if we're in the same arena or uh, similar types of uh, dreams and visions and callings or assignments, then I will uh, base it on that and just uh, choose to invest in that specific person. And then um, I, I have a lot of people who call me um, mentors. And I just want to encourage people with this. Sometimes you can have a mentor from afar. Like you, I have so many mentors that I have absolutely never met. And they have not personally invested in me, but I've read their books. I'm on their podcast. I'm on their Instagram. I'm looking and I'm I'm looking at how they conduct business and how they conduct ministry and how they do those things. And I'm getting invested in just from that. And so uh, just give give people grace too, (laughs) Um, because sometimes you have to understand everyone is not able to specifically invest in you, but like personally, but use their resources, come to their events, purchase their classes. Kashara got got a lot of those (laughs) classes. Purchase their resources and allow yourself to get invested in that way. I love that. I love that. I remember before I recorded my first YouTube video, I was up all night watching Oprah and Ayanla because I didn't know which one I really, like which style I loved, but I knew it was like in between the two. I'm not yelling at nobody. So if y'all got invited to come on, don't think I'm beloved. Like I'm not. (laughs) I'm not. I'm not going to fight you for your healing. I'm not going to fight you to be on the show. That's real. But once you on, we ain't fighting at all, okay? So (laughs) just so you all know, but to your point, you have to do what it takes, you know? Absolutely. And everyone, I mean, I don't know Oprah yet, okay? Not yet. Yet. But I have always admired her story. And once you see women like that, regardless of if I can call her sell or not, it is important to look at what she's done, what content she's put out that I can glean from, even at this stage. Christia, earlier, you mentioned that when you go out, sometimes people know who you are already. One thing that I've noticed with individuals that have contacted me for advice in the legal space is they don't quite know the question to ask, like with specificity, because they're still developing. What would you suggest to someone who does not know exactly what they need from you, but they feel led to contact you? How can they do that in a way that you will actually respond and it won't waste your time nor theirs? No, that's a great question. Um, Because I've given my card out to people, people with my cell phone number, what have you. I think the main thing is one, do your research. Um, before you come. So even if you don't know what you need from someone, you got to at least show up some type of prepared, um, some type of prepared, even if you're not like specific about like, okay, I want to contact Christia about distribution. If you don't know that that's kind of what you want, maybe just like, I want to know how you balance kind of like career and whatever, how you left your job um, and and pursued this. So you can kind of work with the information that's currently out there. And hopefully in that conversation, you may eventually find or be led to what it is you're supposed to need. But you don't have to have all, all the details all the time. Even as I'm building my company now, I don't have all the answers. And so you just have to be, be okay with being where you are and with the information that you have. I love that. I love that answer. And all of these women up here have profiles online. Even in preparation for this, I remember Googling everyone and seeing where you all were at with it. And to what Christia said, sometimes it's a good idea to put a one-liner in there about that individual just so they know that you know who they are. I can't tell you how many IG messages I've gotten that's like, can we collab? And I look at their page and I'm like, we don't even do, I don't do beauty. (laughs) So I think that that's important as well. Now, Another reason why people do not reach out is because of fear. Who's ever been afraid? Who's ever been afraid? Some of y'all are like the Wakandans, like, nope, never. (laughs) Um, I was like, I aim to be that fly. Um, But for those of you that have felt fear, it's not necessarily about acting in the absence of fear, but in spite of fear. Arian, you talk a lot about being fearless and, 
and how you've overcome that or worked in, in spite of that, what would you say to the person who doesn't feel worthy of the, of the purpose that God has imparted within them? How do they get from that place to the place of materializing on that dream? Oh, Lord, why I get the hard question? <laughs> yes, that's my laugh for real. Um, <laughs> Hey, my sister's like, my sister's sitting there. She's like, yes. But I think I get it from mom. I really do. Yeah, it's, my, it's not as high, but she still has that da 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 whatever that is. <laughs> okay, the question one more time is, how does that person get from that place of pretty much being like stagnant to blooming into the butterfly? For the person who doesn't feel worthy. Because we talk a lot about mm. fear, but some of that is rooted in, I'm just not, I don't feel like I'm good enough. What if I speak and I mess up? What if I come and no one talks to me? If I get on the plane by myself, who am I going to sit with? What if no one wants to sit with me? I would definitely, and, and who asked, it was Candace, I can't even look out in the audience, ask the question about like my girlfriends. I would definitely encourage them to get some cheerleaders in their life. Because sometimes you may have a day where you just can't pick yourself up. You may need some people to help you off that floor. Um, so I would definitely encourage that person to get around some people who see the light in them. So even if you can't see it in yourself, surround yourself with some people who do see it in you. And as you continue to stay in those environments, you, it'll start to become a realization for yourself as well. I want to add to that because sometimes people come to these events and they see the people up on these stages and they're like, they ain't scared. No, I'm still scared mm -hmm. because it's the type of situation, say my company has hit a certain point, I've reached a certain amount of success, we continue to grow, and this continues to be my lane. I've been doing this for like close to 10 years, but now I want to start something different. Yeah. I want to step out of the hair care space and start another company and I'm scared and I'm like, not only am I scared because I don't know what I'm doing and I don't have any contacts and connections, but I'm also like, I think it could be bigger than TGIN. So it's crazy when I say it out loud. It's crazy when I meet with investors. It's crazy when I'm like, I think I got a $100 million idea on my brain. So it's like, don't think just because you're sitting there and I'm sitting yes. here that like, I'm not scared myself. So it's like, I have to kind of like mentally pick myself up. I have to talk to those cheerleaders and I have to actually write my goals down and kind of, even if they don't seem believable, I wrote down Several years ago, I want to start a company that makes like $5 million or whatever, get to $5 million in sales by this. So we get there. But the point is, when I'm talking about starting a $100 million company, it's like, I'm like, I sound crazy. But you have to believe in yourself, and you have to say it out loud, to talk to people and say it in rooms like this, because you start to manifest things. Yeah. That, that is so true, because like she said, all of us up here are still are scared. You just you continue to move anyway. anyway. Yeah. yeah. My palms are sweaty, y'all. <laughs> no, seriously. It, it's, and people in that aspect, nobody's any different. You're going to still have those moments. We all do. It's called the human experience. Yeah. <laughs> and we all still have to walk out our faith and all that, too. So, like she said, you see us sitting up here, but we go through the same process that anybody else does. I like what she said about writing down your vision and making mm -hmm. it plain. I remember before I got to law school, I had a 2.1 GPA in undergrad. That's pretty bad, y'all. I mean, you know, I had to graduate, I needed a 2.0, so I wasn't really doing much more, but <laughs> most people were like, there's no way you'll ever get into Northwestern. I was like, I'm going to Northwestern. They were like, there's no facts to support that. I'm like, yeah, but there's faith too. And eventually, once you take the first step, I, I'd never seen my name on a report card with all A's, so I wrote my name at the top, and I put all my classes and wrote A's next to them. Started at John Marshall, transferred to Northwestern. Everybody can't take the front door, but I will take the back, okay? So that's important to dream bigger because maybe I can't do it in my own will, but God can do everything. Yeah. And if you believe he's your daddy, then what's, what's all A's? I mean, that's like, I was praying way too small. I should have been praying with no debt, okay? My faith wasn't there yet. My faith limited my blessing, okay? I didn't even have, student loans is not our portion. I didn't even have to have that, but my faith wasn't big enough. I was just like, God, just get me in. I don't know what's going on. Please just get me in. So... I love what you said about that specifically. Um, but you did the work, though. People always talk about, like, yes. faith without works is dead. And I'll yes. never forget when my um, girlfriend, Megan, her husband, Devon, says, but faith with works is a, is a live thing. Yes. If faith without works is dead, once you put your work with your faith, then it's alive. Absolutely. And you did the work. 
Absolutely. You wrote your name down. You put those A's next to and it. And I studied and still had date night every week. <laughs> That was important for me. And we're gonna talk about work-life balance, but a lot of, I was married before law school. We'll be celebrating six years on Wednesday. Amen. Amen, yes, my husband's so gracious for like, he was like, when's this conference? I'm like, I mean, I didn't even think of the date. I just, he was like, okay, we gonna support this. You gotta do what you gotta do. So I praise God for a supportive husband. I also praise God for the desire to juggle it all. I don't call it balance, but to juggle it all. That was my purest desire, was for it not to be laborious, but for me to make, like, I wanted my marriage to flourish and grow at the same time as everything else. Um, Jen, I want to come to you on this. How have you been able to, I don't use the word balance. Some people do. It's fine. Whichever word you prefer to use. Yeah. How have you been able to juggle building your career, building a, ma a marriage, and also building and growing your relationship with Christ? Wow, I think, um, so I don't like the word balance either. It's more about finding your rhythm, and everyone's rhythm is different. So uh, what my capacity can handle and what my marriage can handle may be different from what your marriage can handle. And so the first thing is really knowing your mate <laughs> and making sure that once you know them and um, you, you can speak to their love languages, in different ways throughout the day while you're accomplishing your task. Now, as far as about uh, growing the relationship with God, it's what kind of what I talked about um, last night as far as that uh, I did a demonstration and I shared how God isn't designed to merely fit in our lives, he's designed to be first. And so because he's designed to be first, we, just, and my husband and I both, we prioritize putting, w putting him first in our lives. Like every Monday, he's, he was just pulling out the calendar uh, on the way here uh, from DC. Like, okay, we need to get back to, you know, our Monday devotionals, you know, and okay, we don't do it every day, but Monday is our day. And I have to honor that. And even when I'm tired, you know, I, I honor that and I prioritize. But for your husband, that may not work. So it's just kind of knowing what works and then kind of flowing and going with that. And then also making sure that, uh, like I said, speak to his love languages. So I know for him, his love language is us having quality time on the couch watching some Marvel comic thing, okay? And, <laughs> and I love Marvel. And, and look. I'm telling you, I totally was not into that uh, at first, but I said, okay, all right, I'm, this is my husband, so I'm going to train myself to enjoy what he does. And so we have a Tuesday night date. And so Tuesday night at 9 o'clock, we're watching The Flash, and I don't do any training calls, any business things around that time, but I'll do it and pick it up, you know, the next day. So that's kind of how I, I, I have my rhythm, so to speak. I love that. I, I also want, I don't know who can answer this question, anyone can, but to pivot it just a little bit, oftentimes we always hear women who are married and or with children answering that question, but how many know when you're single you got things to juggle as well? Yeah. Um, and, and so I want to hear from someone on the panel who's single, dating, how have you also been able to juggle building your relationships and maintaining those and growing them if you're dating um, with your business. Y'all looked at, I looked at, I said, does Katrina have a ring on? But no, she said, for those who are single, and I'm single and dating, and I can say that, um, one, I don't believe in balance, I believe in fulfillment. And somebody was like, what is she talking about? Every time people hear balance, you, you, you envision a scale. Mm -hmm. So that already tells you that you're in the mindset of something has to have 50, something else has to have 50. And that's where people have the struggle because they feel like, oh, God, I'm lacking here or lacking there. And the reality is you might not be lacking in either or. Different things take different pieces. There doesn't have to be a 50-50. Something may take 30% of your time. Something may take 70% of your time. Something may take 40%. It just is what it is. So I, I, I seek to live a very fulfilled life. Um, and the reality is there's no such thing as balance. You just prioritize. Mm -hmm. As far as a single woman's life is concerned, of course, God is the head of our lives as well, too. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, our friends and family, I have a very, you would say, diverse mix. So I have my family time. I have my time with my girlfriends. I have my time with whoever I'm dating. And I have, I have all of that. And of course, we're still running businesses and doing all of it, but it's, a, it's about priorities. It's about what you're choosing to take the time out to do and what's gonna make you fulfilled. 
And then I guess I can answer that as a single person. So I'm 39. I just turned 39 in January. And thank you. Thank you. I don't know if that's because I'm about to turn 40 or if I'm still 39, but thank you. Because we didn't know anyway. Okay. Like. So in terms of, I guess, the question I'll answer is what has my relationships been like as I built this company? I think it's a very interesting story. They've been pretty shitty, and I'll bring that. <laughs> I'm just being honest, and that's both with men and women. And it takes me getting to an honest space where I, I'm, I've owned this, where I'm like, I've had tunnel vision for the last 10 years. I had a full-time job, yeah. and I was running a company that was doing you know, over a million in sales. And so my friends were collateral damage to my own ambition. It was like if I had the choice between going to your baby shower or going to South Africa to make a sale or do a deal, I chose South Africa. I had several situations like that, and as a result, I found myself maybe with less or friends or with damaged relationships. And not only that, I never took the time to go back and say either I'm sorry or I want to repair this because I was so focused on getting to that next goal. But fortunately, cancer was a blessing to me and it forced me to slow down and really think about the importance that my female friends held in my life. And so now I'm in a situation where I'm forced to make those choices between girlfriends and the business, I'm doing a better job at saying, this business ain't going nowhere. I'm gonna go um, deal with my girlfriends. Even this October is Breast Cancer Month. That's huge for my company. One of my girlfriends going to Mexico for her birthday. One of them going on 11 day trip to Morocco. I'm like, I'm supposed, this is our month. But I said, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the girlfriend thing. And now as it relates to men, I'm just gonna be honest, it's like, how would I put this? Because I always keep it 100, and I never know who I'm speaking to in this audience who may be struggling with this. So it's like, <laughs> when you are a successful black woman who is hungry and eats, dreams, breathes, sleeps, whatever it is that is on your heart, it's hard to be in a relationship with someone who doesn't have that same ambition. Yeah. So I, I'm in situations on one hand, you know, and I'm not like, oh, I can only date the, the doctor, the lawyer, the Indian chief. I done dated the electrician, the construction worker. I've dated CEOs who flew me to Dubai, London, what have you. The point is, on one hand, you got guys over here, you know, the everyday nine to five, and it's like, the, the rift in the relationship sometimes becomes that you're so, so driven and they may not articulate that and they're bothered by that. And then on the other hand, you got these people over here who are super, super successful, but to be super, super successful, a lot of these guys are not necessarily available and you can read however you want to be because sometimes the people who are the most successful were the ones who were in their 20s who were the nerds who made the decision yeah. to settle down early, what have you. So being a woman who was like driven, two jobs, successful, I'm in these two worlds. Luckily, it looks like everything's gonna turn out all right because you talk about faith and God opening doors, closing <laughs> windows, opening garage doors. But the point is, I want people to know that it's like when you are a single woman and you are building your empire, this is hard, it's hard. It's hard with your girlfriends, it's hard with these men, and like I said, you go have people over here who want you home at three o'clock because they get off at four o'clock and they want dinner on the table, and then you got people over here that's just like, so it, it, that's my truth. Yeah. That's my truth. Hold on, hold on, I gotta say, yeah, hold this, hold my drink. No, first of all. And we both from Detroit, no, so that's said, my hold, truth. No, I wanna talk to my sister, hold my drink. No, only because I will say this though. One, I love the fact that you were honest mm -hmm. and transparent and had the cur just the courage yeah. to share your truth. That's just, first of all, commendable. I can say that I experienced a lot of that collateral damage, I would say more so in my 20s. So by the time I did get to my 30s, thank you, Jesus, I, I saw that. Because you, know, you all heard the story. So of course I had a lot that was just probably not getting taken care of in those years. That was like earlier 2000s. And so through time, just like with you, you saw that okay, I need to start nurturing these other areas of my life. Um, but Christy, I heard you give your testimony when you were sitting up here about how just your company just flourished the time that you just had to lay back. Mm -hmm. And God showed you that I got this and he performed miracles in your business. And you knowing that from a position of force, you're not just gonna have to know that from a position now of choice. So now that you're not forced to being at home, and you have the choice to choose, just know that God still has your business yes. as you run around with your girlfriends. And he still has your business as you run around dating this man of your dreams who's gonna come scoop you off your feet. 
And I'm, no, I'm serious. It, it's, it's all that is still going to happen, but before you saw it because you were forced to sit, now you're gonna have to make the choice and it's a hard to just choice. Let, let it go. She's no, right. I completely Naturally, agree. You so you make the choice, but it is it's hard. hard. Particularly, and I'm gonna be honest, as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. like I said, people love working for me. And like as we grow as a company, say, we, I don't know how many people work for us, 10, 12, 15, whatever. I don't have kids, but it's like every person wants you to sew into them. Your girlfriends want you to sew into them. Your husband wants you to sew into them. Your boyfriend wants you to sew into them. And then you walk into an office where 10 or 15 people work for you that want you to sew into them. So to make the choice to slow down and to sew into me, it's like, it sounds like that's what you need to do, but it's hard, so. Mm -hmm. No, 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 I, I complete. Now, if you've experienced it being hard, but you also know God can help, put your hands together. <laughs> She's so silly. All right, I wanna go to Chris real quick and talk about self-care, because that's a perfect lead in to that. I remember working, like, I, prayerfully I have, thankfully, I guess, I have a husband who'll be like, I remember leaving for work one day, and Christia, you'll understand this, because we work, in, we work mm -hmm. I work in Big Law. Um, I remember leaving for work like on a Monday and not coming home until like a Tuesday at 7 a.m. And I was working. I had billed 36 hours straight getting ready for a client um, situation. And I remember my husband just being like, you left the house yesterday. Like this is inappropriate. <laughs> and when I got sick from just working so hard, he emailed the head of the firm, the managing partner, and was like, my wife will not be in until further notice. And in fact, you can direct all of your questions and emails about her work to me. Wow. I will be handling this email. And I, I work at a large firm and I remember, I was in the hospital, I was like, you emailed who? He's like, the managing partner, because you talk about him all the time. I was like, yeah, we're cool, but like, we're not like that cool. Like, email from my husband cool, you know what I'm saying? But I say that to say, I had someone who had to sit me down mm -hmm. because I didn't know how to, I have a lot of energy as y'all know, as y'all know now, I didn't know how to always say, no, this is a great opportunity, but I need to be refilled. I heard a Yanla say, in order for your cup to run it over, it has to be full. Arian also talked about this. She said it has to be filled. Someone has to do that. You have to be responsible yeah. for that. So before it gets to the point of like me, like in a hospital somewhere and your man is emailing all your bosses at the company, <laughs> what do you recommend, Chris, to, to, to take care of yourself? And what are some specific things women can start doing? Some free and some if you got to pay for it. Just let us know which ones you like. I am not the best question, the best person to answer this question. I'm really not, but I can answer the question before that, which is about um, men. I have a husband. <laughs> I have a husband that's right there in the back, Derek. I want to give everybody hope for real because I've been in these situations and I was single for a really long time and had the struggle of trying to make it work and trying to find someone that was the perfect person that could understand. And there, it is possible. It is really possible to have your own business and be a boss and work 24 hours and really kind of feel like that is your number one baby and have somebody so supportive. And when I say so supportive, I emphasize that because they do exist. And I mean, even from being here today, he got stuff to do, you know, and he's still here. He, and talk about self-care, if I don't take care of myself, he take care of me, massaging my back because I'm, my back hurts from working all day long and hunching over and, and, and working. So it is possible, it is hard, but it is completely possible to find someone who can support that dream and can kind of take the back seat sometimes when sometimes you're like, okay, I do need to stay at work. The la this whole week, I did not get off work till 2, 3 a.m. in the morning for my studio. I was, and he was at home waiting for me. And that's not normal. <laughs> it's not normal for a man to do that and feel comfortable doing that. But it's not every day now. I do have to reel it back in like, okay, it's been five days in a row. I need to, I guess, cook something for somebody. But, but, but also just the, the fact that he is, is there to say, it's cool, I'll cook. You know, or, you know, not... Putting, holding the standard of me being this typical wife that everyone yeah. feels because that was something I put on myself yeah. like, oh my God, I'm, I'm married now, so now I have to cook every day and now I have to clean. When 
I don't necessarily think I could cook for real, for real. I mean, he likes the food, but, but you know, it's not a standard that he holds me to. So there is, there, there is, um, they are out there. It's just finding someone that can understand and they might not have the regular nine to five or they might have the nine to five and they might also have a not entrepreneurial spirit and understand just what that looks like. So I just want to speak on that. The self-care thing, I'm definitely still working on. I, I try to um, do appointments every month, definitely for my masseuse, and um, I just, that's the thing for me, and always I have a standing appointment for um, ma uh, manicures and pedicures, but outside of that, that's, that's it, pretty much, so. I, I wanted to speak on uh, self-care because that's just something that I'm passionate about as it relates to self-care with entrepreneurs especially because we have these amazing goals and dreams and visions that God has given us. But a part of the reason why we don't properly take the time to have self-care is because we don't really trust God. And I know that's heavy. But a lot of, but the reason why I say we don't trust God because we're trying to do everything and accomplish everything in our own strength, and we forget to just take time to be quiet, to be with Him, and to know that if I take a time, a, a day for myself, you know, to refill my cup, like God is going to still, my business is still going to thrive. It's still going to grow, and so self care is going to look different in different seasons. So when you're starting a business and you're, or you have a project or you have a conference, you know, you will be grinding. You'll be doing everything that you have to do to execute. But then after you have accomplished that goal or that vision, you reward yourself by allowing someone to pour into you, um, by getting that quiet time. Um, it could look like the, a spa date for some, but for some, like for me at times, it's just me taking myself out shopping and taking myself uh, to lunch by myself. And Jeff will call me and be like, okay, this is my me time, you, you know, and I take my hours and, and, and he respects that and honors that. And I'm full from that. Or just going somewhere, like I used to go down to, I live in DC, so I'll go down to the monuments, I'll have my blanket, have my book or whatever, and just, that's my self-care. So you have to find what self-care looks like for you and trust that that vision and that dream, everything that you're doing, you know, God has it. He's going to bring it to pass, but you, he's not, he can't bring it to pass if you're sick, you know, if, if you work yourself in the ground and you have to allow yourself to refill your cup. You have to take a Sabbath and um, a Sabbath isn't necessarily on a Sunday. It is that time that you allow yourself to just refill, refuel, so that you could be the best person, um, the best entrepreneur, the best mom, the best wife, um, whatever role and whatever assignment that you're in, it's so important that you uh, schedule that time for yourself. I love that, I love that. And Arian, you mentioned earlier in, in relate, as it relates to faith that you have to do the work. Um, one word that seems like a dirty word sometimes is discipline. So I want to talk about discipline behavior um, specifically, and you all can self-select who answers this question, but what habits did you form before entrepreneurship or immediately thereafter that have helped you to become successful in your business? Because this is like the stuff y'all don't see. It's like waking up at 4 a.m., not on Instagram in my bonnet. So. <laughs> that's good. No, I got it. That's, that's really good. I can definitely say... Um, Ash, remember the gold journals daddy used to have us write in? We had to start setting goals as children, like elementary school age. <laughs> so we started practicing goal setting very, very young. I was probably eight years old when I had to start writing out my goals. Um, so I can definitely speak to that. I have had the discipline, because sometimes you're not motivated, and that's just, just reality. Yeah. So you have to have discipline. And I have the discipline of always having a to-do list since I was a kid, too. And it had to be written out the night before for the next day. So I've always held that discipline. I know what I have, you know, for 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, all the way through those hours. My eating time was budgeted. My fun time was budgeted. Um, just that. So I would definitely say that kind of structure early on 
definitely helped me later in life. Of course, now I've learned to be more fluid and not as structured and have, you know, more time just to go with the flow and be more spontaneous. But that is the structure that was instilled in me as a young girl that I can say definitely helped me later on. I love that. Um, you pretty much said a lot of what I was going to say is I've become a master of my time and I've learned to be extremely disciplined in that. And even when Jen was talking about the Sabbath of taking time to really rest, um, whatever I do in the moment, I try my best to be there and to be present. So uh, one of the things that I've done since quitting my job has been spend more time with my family. Um, so on Sundays, I'm going to church. I like make it my business to take myself to the movies if that's what I want to do. I make it my business to, you know, spend time with my um, niece, spend time with my family. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like you kind of your time is a currency. So literally, I plan out every 30 minutes of my day. So I'm literally like every single detail of my day, I already have that planned out ahead of time. So I take my to-do list and put it to a timeline on my Google Calendar. But whatever I'm doing in the moment, I'm doing it 100%, whether it's self-care, whether it's building my business, planning for the conference. But even there were moments where I would call my friends in the past couple of weeks. I'm like, y'all tell me, do not go to sleep. Like, I want to fall asleep right now. I don't want to write another email. I don't want to do anything else. But I would have accountability even around my time so that I can get done what I needed to get done, even when it felt like I didn't want to do it. I'd be remiss, honestly, if I didn't share my morning routine. And it just hit me. I was telling you the things that like helped me when I was a child that you know, have helped me to be disciplined today. But I'm serious about my morning routine and I don't miss it. My first few minutes or hour or whatever the day is always with God. I, my first 10 day, I'm not on Instagram. If you see me on Instagram in the morning, just know I was probably up an hour before that. So my first time of the day, y'all heard of probably, this is like very old school though. Like I had that hour daily bread that your grandma used to have. I read that on my phone every morning I go and pray every morning, and then I have cardio. Those things for me, my devotional time and my cardio and all that stuff, that's not even like optional for me, they're mandatory. So I start my day off very centered. So anything that starts coming through the day, I'm, per, I'm more so in control of the day versus the day just running me. Yeah. So I'm not like starting the day off where I'm checking emails and next thing you know, you didn't spend your whole day checking emails, you didn't get nothing done on your to-do list. You know, so I just do my best to stay um, where I can, you know, be proactive of the day versus reactive. So one thing I wanted to touch on with discipline, too, is you have to start to train yourself to do things even when you don't feel like it. And I, I know sometimes we can use, like, self-care is a great thing. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes we kind of use it as a crutch sometimes. Like, you, you can't say I don't feel like it every single day, right? At some point, you have to learn how to operate when you're uninspired. I need self-care, no posting. <laughs> yeah, every day. It's like that's, that's what you lean on, right? And it's like, you at, like there is never going to be, and there's su super successful people on this panel that can vouch. Like, every day is not a good day. But that doesn't mean that stuff has to stop or it doesn't get done. My favorite person to follow on Instagram is The Rock for a number of reasons. But, you know, I love that he's in the gym every day no matter what. He can just get off a plane, just finish filming a movie, and he's always in the gym, and he's, he's always about persistence, focus, work hard. I remember one time, it was like Oscar weekend, and he's at the gym, he's like, all my friends are at the parties, and they call you going to the party. He's like, no, because my competition's at the party, so I'm gonna do what my competition is not doing, so I can beat them tomorrow. And I'm like, let me go work out. Like, <laughs> but you know, I, I wanna challenge that, you know, I know a lot of people have a nine to five, and I know it's tough to build a business when you didn't have a nine to five, but I just, I challenge you, if you can spend eight, 10, 36 hours building someone else's dream, you can dedicate 20 minutes to yours, right? And then build from that 20, 30, 40, 60. Now you're getting up an hour earlier. You're standing up an hour later. Everybody's not a morning person, that's okay. Maybe you're a night owl. Maybe you're using your lunch break. Maybe you shouldn't go to happy hour every single day. That's an extra two hours that you can put towards your business, but starting to learn how to discipline yourself to do things when you're not comfortable, when you're not inspired, when you don't feel like it, when the sun's not shining. Still learning to do that is what's going to separate you from those that are still dreaming two years later versus those that were at this conference now and they're going to be speak, going to be a speaker next year, right? Like those that are doing that work. And this is good for people whether you have a nine to five or a nine to nine because I know everybody's like nine to five. I wish. I feel y'all, okay? <laughs> and it's not everyone's goal. As I said earlier, my goal was to be a lawyer, right? That is a part of what, my, what I am passionate about. And so the, this advice is applicable whether you are interested in staying at your job while building your brand 
or whether you're interested in leaving. Everyone's not interested in leaving. There are several millionaires that have been made at the place that I work right now. And so if your goal is just money, working for someone else can get you there depending on how valuable you are, which goes back to your point earlier. You have to add value where you're at. On this point about discipline, I want to pivot the question a little bit because this is so integral. Um, my, my father, who's a pastor, I got to shout out to Reverend Keith Williams of Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. We will be there on Sunday. Um, <laughs> um, you know, he always says, what would you say if every word out of your mouth was a prayer directly to God's ears and it would manifest? And I think that discipline is not just in what you do, but in what you confess about yourself. There are so many curses that were never intended for you, but you asked for it. You prayed for it, okay? And when you say, you know, like, you, you got to be careful with what you say. I've heard so many people just out of habit agreeing with someone else's negativity when they're not even a negative person. You are praying for their depression. You have to be careful with what you agree with. I want someone on this panel, whoever feels led to speak about this, to just answer the question of how did you become disciplined in your speech? She means by you taking ownership of your words and making sure, because the reality is they do manifest. So how do you become disciplined and conscious to make sure that you're speaking things that you desire to see in your life? Um, when I started to see the power of them, that's when I became disciplined in it. When I started to see if I spoke something negative, that it manifests. And I'm like, whoa, Arian, you just spoke that into your life. You need to watch what you're saying. Um, a sorority sister of mine had me read a book about the power of the tongue. And it was life changing for me. So from there, I started to only speak in the affirmative. And somebody's like, what does that mean? It doesn't, I don't say I don't want to be broke. I, it said it, I have to say I am rich. Because with me saying that I do not want to be broke, my focus and emphasis is on the broke. Yeah. And what we focus on expands. So you have to be mindful that you're speaking in the affirmative. So when I started to see the power of the tongue manifesting in my life, that's when I became more disciplined yeah. of it. I love that. Arian said everything I was going to say. But no, no, it's fine. It's no, it's good. But another practical thing is to simply write out some affirmations and write some scriptures and post them in places that you frequent so that you can consistently keep the word of God and keep those affirmations before you. There were different times of my life um, where I had challenges with um, low self-esteem and I, there was a season of my life where I didn't see my beauty and I had to put up affirmations. I remember writing like I'm fearfully wonderfully made in lipstick on my mirror as a single woman because so every morning I would see that and as I'm in the mirror fixing my hair I would say I'm fearfully wonderfully made and I said it until I believed it. And so a lot of times, you know, it's just, I remember even in my car, I, there was a time I was um, going to my nine to five and I was challenged with depression uh, because of the uh, hostile environment in the office. And so I remember uh, putting up scriptures and, and, in my um, cubicle and putting scriptures in my car and different things like that and posting them. And then I would speak those things um, over my life while I'm there and they would build me up and they would encourage me and just keep me focused on what it, whatever it was that I was working towards. I love that. And when you don't know what to say, you can always say the word. My prayer life went way up when I just started declaring what God says I am. Lord, I know how I feel, but your word says, let the weak say I am strong. Your word says, let the poor say I am rich. And when you don't know what to say, the word will always guide you. Put yourself in the promises of God, which are found in the scriptures. And if you're, if you are just recently getting into the word seriously, a great place that I was instructed to start was Psalms, because there's so many promises in Psalms, uh, the book of Psalms. So you just be encouraged uh, by that. Now we're running out of time, unfortunately. But I want to hear what's next for you ladies. You've done so much. You've obviously built so much. But I know that all of you are declaring even bigger and better things for yourself, even after having such a level of success. So if we could just go down and if I could hear what's next from all of you. And we'll start. 
Christia. So, oh, 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 okay. <laughs> so I think what's next for me is that I am going to start a startup within a startup um, focused on digital storytelling and multimedia um, to allow me to unleash my creativity. And then I am currently in the process of working on my second business. I love that. I think, oh, we all got my second now. <laughs> I, I think that is beautiful. That is so beautiful. Honestly, um, What's next for me is just growing my brand and my platform and things of that nature. But what was brought on my heart here, when I got on the plane just to come here, I sat next to somebody on the plane, that happens to be my, one of my fraternity brothers, and he was like, Marion, you really need to get women together um, in the VC world to help more fund more startups in our community. Mm -hmm. He was like, you have enough influence. I see who your girlfriends are. If all you all just came together and put 25 here, 25 there, and just get a VC fund just started just so that we are the angel investors and the seed investors yeah. before people even get to like those series A's, yeah. B's, or C's, that we're, we're there on the front lines, she's on my book at her back, yeah. helping, helping our businesses grow. So for me, that is what's something that's next. I'm like, I gotta get my girls together, get a network going so that we can be the ones to help to fund our community and our startups. I love that. Let's clap it up for that. That's a seed. Uh, for me, the next thing is to continue developing my brand. I have hidden, uh, and, and I think direct sales is definitely a blessing, but I've hidden in that uh, for so long, and I have been just really encouraged, okay, Jennifer, it's time like for you to continue to put yourself out there and develop your brand. And also, uh, my husband and I are really passionate about marriages and helping couples work through uh, their everyday life. And so our very next thing, uh, next week we're releasing a couple's journal. So we're really excited to get that into the hands uh, of couples to really help them uh, work together to achieve their goals and also to pray together and all kinds of cool stuff. So. Awesome. Um, so what's next for me? Um, actually, last week, I officially became a published author. Okay. Woo! Um, so I released a devotional called um, the Morning After Prayer Devotional. Um, it's a 30-day guide to sexual purity. Um, even with Epic Fab Girl, on the closing remarks, you'll kind of know some of the things that we're doing. But we're really expanding into having a podcast um, and sharing stories of entrepreneurs. Um, we're also expanding to have a membership surrounding this community so that we can stay connected. So um, I'll tell you guys a little bit more about that later. Uh, for me, I'm definitely working on continuing to grow my cosmetics line, you know, coming up on that one year anniversary this year. So I have so many more, you know, milestones and goals I want to hit with that. I am working on my next book project. You'll find out more about that later. Um, and the, in the past year, I've had a ton of opportunities to do speaking outside of where I'm from and where I live. So I want to continue to grow that and get in front of people and spread the power of personal branding and multiple streams of income. Awesome. That's really great. Um, so I, I've taken a shift a little bit, um, primarily in the beginning of this year, I, I said I'm going to focus on my personal brand and even Candace, we've talked about, you know, publishing a book, but I've taken a different shift and thought that I really need to, our community, specifically women of color, as you mentioned, uh, we need to be cultivated, inspired, and educated a little bit more. So my focus really is through Made Magazine, cultivating a community and inspiring a generation to be greater and th be better through summits and um, workshops and empowerment tools. And additionally, for the coffee, Chicago French Press, my goal is to take the proceeds from our bags and to fuel Chicago underserved communities. So that's my immediate goal. Well, I love that. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you all so very much for your time, for your stories, and hopefully we can get some of them on uh, Passion, Purpose, and Paychecks. And I know me and Christia have something scheduled, so stay tuned. Um, but it was wonderful to hear from you all. Let's give them a round of applause as we end this panel.